Tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Karen West, a board member of Infrastructure New Zealand and Chief People and Communications at Harrison Grierson. I have the pleasure of introducing today's session, which is Setting the Scene, Demographic Change and Meeting Future Challenges. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to remind you to direct questions to speakers using the live Q&A function. Uh, we encourage you to use the discussion forum to leave comments during the session, and you can also post updates on the event stream. Now it's my privilege to introduce Simon Dine, Chief Operating Officer, Infrastructure Fulton Hogan. Simon attended the University of Canterbury, where he studied engineering, a profession that runs in his family's blood. With a keen love of the outdoors, he was soon working in the forest industry for Carter Holt Harvey after leaving university in 1998. Simons quickly progressed through management roles and ended up running the northern region with over 100,000 hectares of forestry and 50 staff under his guidance. As regional manager, he was responsible for forestry operations, engineering, harvesting and trucking from Tairua up to Cape Reinga. After helping with the sale of Carter Holt Harvey's northern forest assets to Ryanair, Simon moved on to self-employment and project management before signing up with Fulton Hogan in 2006. Simon is now the Chief Operating Officer for Infrastructure. As the COO, Simon is responsible for all regional based operations across New Zealand. He is a chartered professional engineer with significant governance experience, including as a current board member of Allied Asphalt, Rodney Aggregates, Stevenson Aggregates, Stevenson Concrete, Auckland Harbour Bridge Alliance, Coastline Markers, Auckland System Management Contract, and the Capital Journeys NOC Contract. Simon has a strong commitment to sustainability, including attending the Prince of Wales Business and Sustainability Program and spearheading key initiatives, including the implementation of green fuels biodiesel in Auckland, recycled asphalt and concrete production facilities, and the conversion of Fulton Hogan's Auckland Laboratory to solar power. In 2015, Simon was awarded the IPWA Young Engineer of the Year Award. He also has a keen interest in the Infrastructure Skills Centre, a Fulton Hogan initiative developed with the Ministry of Social Development. He has a strong focus on encouraging diversity into the construction industry and champions looking after the true skilled workers who keep New Zealand moving. Over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. I think I need to uh, trim up that, uh, that waffle that I wrote, but uh, it is actually eminently more uh, qualified to talk about this topic. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the distinguished professor emeritus Paul Spoonley, uh, who was until 2019 the Pro Vice Chancellor of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Massey University. Uh, he retired from Massey University in April 2021. He is the author or editor of 28 books. The most recent is New New Zealand, Facing Demographic Disruption, published in late 2020. He was a program leader of research program on the impacts of immigration and diversity on Aotearoa. He was made a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 2011 and was granted the distinguished professor, the title of distinguished professor by Massey University in 2013. Awarded the Science and Technology Medal by the Royal Society in 2009, he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley in 2010. And since 2013, he has been a visiting researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity at Göttingen in Germany. The Auckland War Memorial Museum made him a fellow in 2015. He is currently a member of the Marsden Fund Council and a senior affiliate of Koitu, the Centre of Informed Futures. He has been a long time participant in the Metropolis Network and recently became co-chair of this international network of those interested in migration. Uh, thank you, Paul. Over to you. Um, kia ora tata katoa, uh, nā mihi, nā mihi nui. Um, thank you, Simon, uh, for that. Um, <laughs> I must trim mine up as well. Look, what I really want to talk about is the way in which New Zealand society, and particularly its demography, is changing. 
And I want you to think back to 2010 because we began to see a major series of changes in 2010 to, the, to our society in terms of demographic makeup. And what we'll see through the 2020s and 2030s is an extension of those demographic changes. So here's Sarah Harper from Mercer, who's talked about a sea change, and I agree with that. And the book that Simon very kindly mentioned is there on the right. Uh, because of COVID, because of some other changes, I've had to update that, and we've now got a new version out. So even in the space of a year, things are changing so fast. I want to talk about some of those changes, and I want to do it at a fairly rapid pace and I want to come later in the, in the presentation to how well our territorial authorities are understanding and anticipating uh, some of these changes. So in, in simple terms, although it's much more complex than its, in, in its outcomes, is that we've got a very rapidly aging population. And as you'll see, there are doubling of the over 65 population alongside declining fertility. So at some point in the next decade, there'll be more over 65s than there will be under 15 year olds. So we've gone sub-replacement fertility. There's ongoing urbanization in the Golden Triangle of Auckland, Tauranga and Hamilton. And so we're seeing that ongoing drift of our population to the top half of the North Island. Whereas some other parts of New Zealand are already experiencing population stagnation, the population's not going, or in decline. So the Central North Island, the west coast of the South Island are experiencing population decline. And as a result of that, and I think in terms of the theme of this conference of building nations and in the needs of the infrastructure sector, one of the key points is going to be what's called the labour crunch, which has not been caused by COVID, but which has been accelerated by COVID. So let me give you a quick version of New Zealand's population. The black line is the population growth of New Zealand. And at each point that we change our immigration settings, we see a spike. So we changed our immigration in 86, 87, the Labor government did it, and we see that spike. Uh, Labor government again changed it in 2000, again we see a spike. And then as we came out of the GFC in 2013, the key government saw immigration as being important. Now the reason for showing you this is that New Zealand's population has been growing at a rate which has been quite extraordinary. And so the other two lines are the European Union and the OECD. So if you look at number three there, we grew at 2.1% annual population rate in 2020, 2019, 2020, when the OECD average annual population growth was 0.4%. And this is made up of three factors. One is the New Zealanders, and if you look at 2012, 2013, you'll see that uh, the orange below line saw a major exodus of New Zealanders. 24,000 New Zealanders left to live in Australia in 2012, permanently in Australia, in 2012 alone. The green is the excess of births over deaths, what we call natural increase. But the blue is the contribution of net migration to our population. And as you can see there in 2018, uh, it was, well, it was, it was significant from 2015, and by 2020, two thirds of our population growth was coming from net migration gain. At this point, we are getting net gain from New Zealanders. So New Zealand's gone through this extraordinarily high spurt of population growth because of incoming migration. So the components of this, the first is the aging of the population. And the map on the right shows you the population age of regions in 2031. What I draw your attention to are the red areas. So those areas that are colored red will see at least 30% of a population, the local population, aged over 65. And already the Kapiti Coast, parts of Coromandel are at that point. The light red areas are where between 25 and 29% of a population are aged over 65. The blue area down south, which is Queenstown Lakes, is probably not going to stay blue. Now, when I was growing up, about 8% of my community were aged over 65. I'm a baby boomer, so the 1950s and 60s. You can see that a very different New Zealand is emerging. The second component is the decline in the fertility rate. In 2014, 
we were at replacement level fertility, which is 2.1 births per woman. Um, the figures came out yesterday, and we're now at 1.66 births per woman, so we're sub-replacement fertility. And in many years, there is not only a decline in our fertility rate, but an absolute decline. And so what we'll see is declining school populations. So if we see a decline this year in the birth and the numbers that are being born in New Zealand, then in five years' time, we'll see a decline in the in the um, those coming to primary school, and then of course entering the workforce. So since 2010, 2010 is significant because that's when the baby boomers arrived at the age of 65. So we're beginning to see them retire out of the workforce. They're a very large cohort. And since 2010, most high income countries have been experiencing a labor crunch. And that labor crunch got so much worse because of COVID. And this is an economist uh, cartoon. And as you can see, the, the pipeline has just got that big COVID barrier within it. And um, I want to acknowledge Simon and the Fulton Hogan team here because, you know, they are really beginning to address some of these labor crunch issues with the Infrastructure Skills Centre. But the map I've got there is the map of New Zealand in 2043. And what you should pay attention to is the dark blue areas where we are forecasting a 20% decline in the working age population of that region. So 20% fewer workers in that region. And the lighter blue is between 3 and 19%, 19.99% decline. So if you're in those regions, you should be seriously worried about future labour um, supply. Um, again, I've circled Queenstown Lakes because I don't think that uh, we should anticipate a 20% increase in labour in the Queenstown Lakes. I think that the temporary worker and temporary resident population means that COVID has changed the forecasts. So alongside the Infrastructural Commission, we are anticipating that over the next two or three decades, the majority of our population growth will occur in Auckland. There's a significant but, and I'll come to that in a moment, but you can see here that half of our future population growth will occur in Auckland, and then you should add in Tauranga at 4.3% and Hamilton at 5.2%. So that's that move north, and we've been forecasting this for some time. There is a but, and that but is that COVID is changing these dynamics. Um, we've got some new data which shows just from a few weeks ago the dark blue line is the percentage change in 2020, so that's the growth, and you can see there some regions like Tasman grew at over 3.5% that year, and then the green, um, I guess it's green, bars show the impact of COVID, so the growth in regions has just been pared back very significantly, and you can see there that Auckland, along with Southland and the West Coast, has seen a slight population decline. Now, for Auckland, the population uh, decline up to June 2021 will be 1,300 people. That will be a temporary situation for Auckland, probably, in my estimation, lasting between two and five years. And then we should expect the agglomeration economy of Auckland will continue to grow and attract people and grow jobs, and it will be a major destination for migration. Now, coming to migration, the migration story is an extraordinary story for New Zealand over the last five years. In the uh, 12 months to June 2020, we had a net gain of 79,400 from permanent migrants. The arrivals were 153,900, and we got a, 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 permanent, a gain of permanent uh, arrivals of 79,400. Our normal gain would be between 12 and 15,000 per year. We've never seen figures like this. This is quite extraordinary. And by the way, when you look at the OECD countries, no other country has net, uh, um, a net gain from migration of this amount, proportional, of course, to population. But when we went into lockdown, we had 221,000 migrants here on temporary work visas, and we had another 82,000 here on uh, student visas. I've included the students because they could work up to 20 hours per week. 
So we had, in addition to that 79,400, we had 310,000 people here on temporary work and study visas. That is a third higher than the similar figures for Australia for both permanent arrivals and temporary arrivals. And of course, COVID happened. We've just got the latest figures um, for 12 months to uh, September 2021. The net gain is 800, arrivals 47,000. I've circled the 170,000 because the government have uh, announced that 165,000 of them are eligible to apply for permanent residence. So that's very significant. It's a very significant offer to those temporary migrants. Obviously, what has happened is that immigration and COVID have reinforced our reliance on migration for skills. And I'm part of a, a network. Um, Simon mentioned the metropolis. We've got a, a working group that's looking at what will encourage mobility. I do get rather annoyed at comments that say mobility, migration is opening up, borders are opening up. No, that's actually not true. There are all sorts of new provisions. And I would like us to have a look at Singapore. And as you can see, that they, what they've got are the, these provisions. Um, a digital pass, they use the IATA one. If I'm coming from New Zealand, the PCR test before departure on arrival, and I've got a seven day stay at home requirement, and on day six, I would another, need another PCR test. Uh, interestingly, of course, uh, travel insurance by and large does not cover COVID at the moment. And so they require you to uh, have cover of $30,000 if you get ill. Um, and then there's the enforcement. And of course, the Singaporeans take enforcement very seriously. You need an air travel pass to get to Singapore. And of course, you have the Tracer app on your phone. Um, but what's really interesting is that Singapore was very like New Zealand under lockdown and a zero COVID approach. And I've taken the daily deaths. And as you can see, for big chunks of the last year, very few deaths at all. In September, Singapore began to um, ease up on the domestic lockdown requirements and to provide that uh, provision for non-Singaporean residents, non-Singaporean citizens to come into the country. And what you can see here is the impact. And so right around the Western world and part of Asia, what you're seeing is the fourth wave of COVID. And we can talk about a lot of countries, uh, the UK, Austria, Germany, and the impact of opening up on both the health services and hospitalizations, and as you can see here, in deaths. So Singapore in the last two weeks are beginning to rethink their opening up and the um, move away from some of the lockdown measures. Now, I said before that um, uh, these demographic changes, both domestically at the border and, 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 and uh, as you've heard internationally, um, have impacted significantly on the composition of our population in New Zealand. So what I've done recently, um, this year, the territorial authorities, there are 67 of them, as I'm sure you're aware, were required to provide 10-year plans. Can I finish off on this point? Because um, my question, as you can see, is how good are they at forecasting population? The answer is not very well at all. So when I look around the population and workforce projections of these long-term plans of the local authorities, I mean, I've taken them because they've been developed this year, they cover the next 10 years. I could look at the sectors, I could look at um, Simon's sector and look at the, 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 um, the workforce planning that uh, might or might not be taking place for um, um, the build and construction sector. But let me just um, provide you with an example in this case um, long-term plans of local authorities. I find it very difficult when I look at those long-term plans to understand what sort of assumptions they've used. What sort of fertility rates are they using? What sort of immigration rates are they using? Um, some of the territorial authorities have contracted specialist agencies to develop population models. Fantastic. They are the in the minority. 
Most of them do not. They use in-house expertise. Most of them do not include any details of future population projections. So I'm looking there saying, okay, you anticipate ongoing future population growth. Tell me about it. They don't tell me about it. And I think some of them are completely unrealistic. And so what I see is that um, quite a few talk about the aging of their region, of their community. Some of them talk about migration. Almost none of them talk about fertility in the region. So I've because I've done some work in Hawke's Bay, I've taken three of the four Hawke's Bay authorities. I've looked at Hastings District Council. Their recent growth has been very high, 2.1%. And as you can see, I've taken out the, the key phrase. They expect that increased population growth to occur over coming years because of lifestyle attractions and economic development opportunities. They expect migrants to come to the region. I have done my own projections. I anticipate growth at about 0.8%. Central Hooks Bay District Council have been growing quite fast at all. They've used um, work done by um, Benji Patterson, Squillian Limited. Um, I anticipate future growth at about 0.7%. Napier City Council were the only one that I think um, took a realistic view of what growth would look like. And they've had recent growth at 1.5%. They see that as declining to 0.45% and then to 0.2% by the 2040s. That is a very different picture. And when we think about um, infrastructure provision, you can see there, there are three quite different scenarios. And why? Well, because of that changing fertility rate in births, Hawke's Bay over a five year period used to have around 11,000 births per five years. Now they're getting about 10 and a half thousand. So in the last um, two decades, the population's grown by 17%, births have declined by 4%. So you can see that changing dynamics of them. And then by 2038, the under 14 year olds will comprise 17% of Hawke's Bay's um, population, 65 plus year olds will be 38% of the population. You can imagine the sort of changes that are required. So let me finish up and we can perhaps have um, some questions. Um, I'm a bit of a fan of The Economist and The Economist has been doing some work around this. And The Economist has talked about the three P's. Uh, slightly simplistically, but let's just stick, stick with me here. One of them is the um, payments or the wage structures and the incentives to the local workforce. And this is where I want to acknowledge Simon and Fulton Hogan. We have done a very poor job in anticipating future skill and labour demand in New Zealand and then backfilling that with an education and training programme. We used to do repeat surveys of employers and we would ask employers what their um, anticipated skill and labor requirements would be for five years out. Couldn't get answers, had to bring it back to three years. And when you ask many employers in New Zealand, they just simply do not have that sort of data. So actually thinking about the, um, the, the talent supply, the pipeline becomes really, really difficult. And the Productivity Commission have been asked by the government in relation to immigration to say, well, are we paying our local workers enough and incentivizing them and training them? The second is passports. Um, I think many New Zealanders think the borders are gonna open not only in New Zealand, but around the world. And if you look at IATA, the International Airlines Association, if you look at the Heathrow Airport Authority, if you look at um, 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 Deloitte's, all of them are anticipating a settling down period and borders not opening until between 2023 and 2024. So I think that we are having to think about what happens. And I'm in a working party that's looking at harmonization. If you're going to travel around the world, what sort of vaccine passport are you going to use? And at the moment, it is completely disorganized. So I talked to you before about IATA passport used by Singapore. You would go to Germany, you would go to the US, use completely different things. So the third thing is really a little bit of patience around COVID, because as you can see, and as you watch your television screens of, of a night, COVID is not done yet. Countries like the UK are experiencing a very major surge, both in hospitalization and, and deaths, even though both hospitalizations and deaths have been impacted by higher um, 
um, higher vaccination rates. And I would add a fourth P, which is population. If you're sitting in the infrastructure sector, you are going to have to think about the composition of your populations and, and centres and regions. You're going to have to think much more carefully about your workforce um, because the uh, exit of workers. Uh, you're going to have to think about the future of regional labour markets, regional um, populations, and of course we've got that reduced mobility and migration. So here's my final slide. Um, what worries me is our policy innovation system up to the task. When I look at our media, and I've been doing quite a bit of analysis of the media, I hear a lot of people talking about their need for workers, um, the need for the government to open up borders, um, all sorts of pressure, which look back to a model that might have existed in the past, but which COVID has altered, but also, as you can hear from me, demography has altered. So a lot of those old um, policies and provisions that we had in place are simply not fit for purpose uh, in the next two decades. How good are our population and workforce projections? As you can see, looking at the territorial authorities, I have to say the majority of them don't even get a pass mark. They just do not do the work and the um, modelling that is required. And so my final question is, in terms of the sector, in terms of your organisations, Simon, I'll put you on the point in terms of Fulton Hogan, how good are you at beginning to anticipate these social and demographic changes and how are you beginning to respond? Thank you very much indeed. All right, thank you very much uh, for that, Professor. Um, just one question, if I could start, was the impact of retirement age. And you you talk about, uh, you know, the reducing amount of labour that's going to be available, particularly in some areas, but also with COVID, if travel isn't going to be available for a while, you know, is that a temporary solution? And if so, does that just defer the problem or, or kick the can down the road? So It does It does kick the can down the road, I think, Simon. And, and can I just say that I use 65, but in fact, 65 is not the age of retirement. And I think we've probably got to have a discussion about our retirement provisions, a universal super, uh, whether it's mean tested. But the other thing is a quarter of our population aged over 65 still work. And that's the second highest in the OECD. And I do a, an annual survey for diversity works. And I'm also a diversity judge. And what I see is some very good practice. But what strikes me is that the majority of employers that we survey say, yes, ageing of the workforce is an issue. And then the majority of those don't have policies. So if we talk to them about gender, they would say, yes, gender is important in the workplace these days, and these are our policies. It, 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 it staggers me that we don't have workplace policies or sector policies designed to address the challenges of ageing and why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we address that? So, just another follow-up question based on that. If you if you ended yes. up in a situation, um, and I'm going to use a hypothetically, but based on your map, yes. a wire or a or a bulla where you're predicted yes. to decline, and you have a big infrastructure investment because something is falling apart, like a water reform situation, what? You know, what do you actually do in that situation? Because you might actually be better off not investing if the population is rapidly declining and putting that money somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> and I think I think there's a whole lot of things, Simon, that we've got to ask questions about. So I've just done some work around long-term care beds. We need 12,000 long-term care beds over the next six years. At the current state, uh, currently the state provides those, but the question is who's going to fund them and where are they going to be located? You could ask about dementia units. You could ask about um, retirement homes. You can ask all, all sorts of questions. And what we've seen is that Auckland, because of its growth, um, Ministry of Education are anticipating adding another 100,000 primary and secondary school places to the Auckland educational market over the next two decades. That's 100,000 fewer places in the rest of New Zealand. So we're going to see a, another phase of school closures. Unless governments want to even out the population growth of Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch, 
and begin to distribute that population to the regions. And, you know, Wairau would be a good case in point. And I think the three waters debate, I mean, it's got highly politicised, but the three waters debate um, highlights some of these issues about the cost of, of infrastructure spend um, and where that spend should be and who pays for that. So if you look at a region like the Manawatu Whanganui region, 40% of ratepayers are on fixed incomes, the majority of them on superannuation. If you've got major new local infrastructure builds that the council is expected to, to pay, how are you going to increase the rates with a fixed um, income population to afford that? Mm. I think these are huge problems. Some good questions coming in now. Um, New Zealand is a cork on the world's ocean. Can't we just open the immigration tap to solve our workforce? <laughs> um, yes, you could do. Yes, you could do, but you're going to put huge pressures on our infrastructure. So those of us who live in Auckland, Simon, hey, we're, we're, the, the infrastructures are way behind the population growth. And I, I don't know, what, what would you put, a 10 years or 20 years behind, perhaps even more, 20 year, 10 years behind population growth. Auckland's been the fastest growing city in Australasia because of migration. So migration adds to the demand for infrastructure. And I think we've got to find some sweet point. My own preference is that we should go with Australia and Canada and say that 1% of our annual population, um, uh, equivalent to 1% uh, of our population should be our net gain. That's 50,000 people. So it's a, quite a way down from 79,400. But um, if the question is, can't we just open our borders and, and have all of these temporary and, 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 um, and um, uh, uh, permanent workers? No, I, I'm in the orchard. I own an orchard. What frustrates me is that we've relied on cheap labour, particularly through the RSC scheme, and we haven't invested in technology. And that's what the Productivity Commission are being charged with. Uh, I, I think often, sometimes, immigration is an option which makes us, um, which which doesn't encourage or incentivize to look at other options, particularly um, technology improvements. Yeah, I mean, that leads on to another question someone's answered, which is exactly along that line is, you know, how much should we accelerate investment into automation to, to support the demographic shift or to recognize that it is a real issue? Yeah, and, and I think we've got to, I mean, if we look at the countries that are furthest down this demographic transformation, which is Germany and Japan, um, what you see is those much that much greater investment in technology and the way in which um, technology begins to change things. And, and if I'm talking to a, a, a year 13 class, I will say two things. One is that 40% of the jobs that currently exist won't exist in 10 years' time. And the second is that 65% of the jobs that you will do as a year 13 um, person coming out of secondary school in New Zealand have yet to be invented. So we need, we need investments in, in training and education that uh, prepare people for this much more digital, knowledge-based world. Uh, but we still need people who can drive tractors or trucks or, you know, um, um, build houses. So, so we're in this very interesting space and, and we've got to think about how we incentivize. We're, our productivity is lagging because of our lack of investment in, in new technologies. So the, uh, hypothetically, if the borders opened around the world, do you think we'll have more people coming in or leaving? It's, it's a good question. I guess my concern has been there's some massive infrastructure projects that attract people with high wages in places like Australia and that yeah. the fear of people leaving is greater than the thought of needing people to come in. So what's your opinion on that? Well, um, in, in the last month, I've seen two polls which look at the attractiveness of destinations around the world. And both of those polls put New Zealand as number one. So if I look at the major survey of international students, which took place in Canada around the world, when they were asked about the country that was most impressive in terms of dealing with COVID, New Zealand was number one by, by a margin. Um, however, when it came to saying, well, what are the opportunities for international students in New Zealand? We didn't do quite so well. And then the other survey is about um, attractive destinations. Again, New Zealand is first equal because of how we operate and particularly how we've operated over the last two years. 
Um, there's not going to be any shortage of people, particularly middle class professionals, who want to come to New Zealand. However, we suffer because we've got a very large labour market adjacent to us. And when we started to open the bubble with Australia, my advice to government and to others, some sectors, not your sector, was that you've just opened the door for skilled, qualified people to go to Australia to earn a quarter or a third more in terms of income. So that, that outpouring in 2012 of 54,000 people who left New Zealand to live permanently in Australia, you've just created exactly those um, conditions. And why would you do that? Why didn't you think about that? Uh, well, of course, we, <laughs> we closed the border with Australia. So that's going to be one of those yin-yang tensions, Simon. Okay. Uh, there's a good question here from Harry, which is, um, how could social changes affect population projections? Could the rise of remote working lead to more people living in the regions, you know, an increase instead of decrease those populations? And I guess we see that with, you know, the theory behind broadband and, and working from home. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know. Now, good question, Harry. And I think I think it will encourage people to move out of the major centres and to move for lifestyle reasons. So particularly people who are about to have children or have children, young children, will quite often move to regions to do that. What we tend to forget is that what's called the geography of jobs. If you're a young, skilled person, you want to have a good um, barista nearby, you need to have a good gym, you need to get to, you, you want to get to good cultural events, you want to have good range of restaurants. And so what we see around the world is that young adults migrate out of our regions and go to our major centres. Partly, I'm being slightly facetious here, but partly to get away from parents, but also to do exciting things. And so very often the flow out of cities is more than replaced by the numbers of young adults but both for education and job purposes, coming into those cities and because of migrants. What we, what we struggle to do is encourage migrants to go to, and I'll use your example, Simon, of Wairoa. Migrants don't go to Wairoa. And so you get this disproportionate attraction to the city. 60% of our permanent migrants end up in Auckland. Auckland is the beneficiary of our migration policies, not our regions. And so that's the that's the playoff I think that uh, that occurs. Um, we, we built a new office and base in Waira, so I do love Waira, by the way. <laughs> um, I do too, um, Sam, and I do too. I don't, I don't want to just, just pour old Waira. No, I do like them. Uh, just last, and I'm sorry, there's some people I'm not going to get to their questions. So this will make this the last one a bit off topic, but um, interested. This person's interested in your opinion about better work-life balance and whether it's actually a double-edged sword in terms yeah. of reducing productivity. Yeah. Um, um, we did some work uh, in the 1990s. You know, the, the Labour government in the 1980s changed how we worked. And, of course, the, um, the national government in the 1990s continued to that. And we, we, we worked quite differently. And we were interested in people doing non-standard work, which was temporary, um, part-time, contract, um, fixed-term, third-party. And of course, what's now happened in 2021, those what we used to call non-standard have now become standard. Those are what, how most people in New Zealand work in those sorts of things. So Simon and I work for people full-time, nine to five, ongoing um, expectation of employment. Simon and I are now the minority of people in terms of our work conditions. What that's done is that it's allowed people, particularly contractors, to have a great deal of discretion over their work-life balance. And quite often they're well paid for that. But that's only a third of people. What re if you look down at the bottom end of the non-standard, what we would call it in the past, the part-time workers, most of those jobs are now what I would call precarious. They're not particularly well paid. Uh, you'd be surprised, over 10% of us work in three or more paid jobs because one paid job is not does not give us enough salary to live off. So we're beginning to see that that sort of precarity at the bottom of the of the um, of the labour market in terms of income and certainty of work. So it's what, it's one of the big things that's just quite unsettling, and some people much better work life balance, but others know it it's been a real challenge in terms of facing this different world of work. All right, we've run out of time, but thank you very much. Appreciate.
your presentation, Paul. And um, I think we hand back to Karen now. Thank you, Simon. A big thank you to both Simon and Professor Spoonley for your time uh, today and uh, sharing the challenges we all need to be considering. Uh, so thank you for that. A big thank you to Fulton Hogan for sponsoring the session uh, this afternoon. They will be available uh, in the sponsor hub if you'd like to meet uh, with Fulton Hogan. Uh, and just sharing the next session is social outcomes. Uh, so we look forward to, to you all joining us for that session shortly. Thank you, everyone.